Good evening, good evening everybody. Um, my name is Daryl McKee. I'm the membership manager at Curl Sask. Um, welcome to our first town hall, Curling Club town hall of the year. We're just going to wait a few more minutes to let everybody join who's planning to join and then we'll get started. Okay, well, it's 7.02 now, so I think we'll get started. And everybody's joining us as we go. That's great. They can catch up as we go. So basically the agenda for this evening, and this is going to be our first town hall of the year for curling clubs. There's many to come, probably. Um, we're we already got a second one planned for September 28th at 7 p.m., and we'll give you some details of that at the end. But I can put that in your calendars now. We'll cover some other topics, um, actually curling topics, uh, as we get going for the season. So our agenda for this evening, though, is we're going to talk about our affiliation process for this year and our MAP grant process. So we've made a few tweaks to that, um, really trying to simplify the process as much as we can um, for you clubs and for us to administer it as well. So we think we've done some great improvements there and we'll walk you through that this evening. Um, we'll talk about a club survey um, that, we, that we're planning to do and send out here in the coming days. And we'll give you some details of that, similar to what we did last year as well. And then we'll really jump into the 2021 return to play guidelines um, for this year. Um, and give you some details on that and where we're at with that. Um, as I know, you're all planning your seasons as we speak. So, And then at the end, we'll have an open forum for questions and any other topics you may want to talk about. So that's kind of the agenda for this evening. Just some um, administrative points. So if you can, I think we, if you entered your name and club name in the chat box, that'd be great. So we can manage our attendance. We know who's attended this evening. Um, when you're not speaking, please ensure your mic's on mute. Um, but, and we'd like to take your chats or your questions through the chat box as we go through the presentation this evening. When we get to the end, if you want to unmute and ask a question, um, that'd be fine. But as we go through the presentation, which is probably going to take about 25 to 30 minutes, um, just send your chats through. They will address them as we go through. Um, but you can open your mic up at the end. So, so curling club affiliation. Um, so it's really a pretty simple process on how to affiliate with Curl Sask. Um, it's really number one: complete your Curl Sask member form. And we've done some changes to the dates here, so pay, take note of that. So we're really looking for that form by October thirty first, and I'll walk you through more details on that as we go. Um, and then the second step is to submit your club member list. Um, and we're looking for that by February 1st. And then submit your $15 per member to Curl SAS for all members over 12. And the deadline for that um, is really February 1st as well. Um, one thing to note, and you can find all this on the Curl SAS um, website. We've done a few tweaks to the website recently. So if you haven't been there for a bit, um, where you're going to find, we've actually put a place in there for member clubs now at the top right hand corner. And you'll find all this under in that tab under member affiliation. So you can see that here on the top right hand side here, member clubs now you can see. So that's really where our club landing page is for anything um, specific to club information. And then if you click on the um, 
affiliation, how to affiliate piece on that, you'll come to this page. And this is really walks you through this process I'm gonna walk you through. So number one um, is filling out your member form. And we're really going online this year now. So if you click on this member form now, it'll take you to an online form um, that looks like this. So the member form is gonna look um, a little bit different, but it's really the gist of the member form is looking for club information, contact information, emails, phone numbers, for the most part. Uh, one thing to note here is that we've combined the membership form and the MAP application form into one form this year to try and make it simpler as well for you. So if you scroll down this um, form online, you'll see the MAP application form at the end. So the second step is really to get your member list. So this is really important information for us at Curl Sask. It's really how we drive our programs, what we focus on, um, what our resort, what, where to put our resources. And we're really trying to build up our database of, of, for our membership. So we're really looking for a really structured member list from you this year. So if you click on this member list template, um, which again is due February 1st, you're gonna come to this form and it's an Excel form that we really want you to use this year. We've been pretty lenient in the past on what forms we would accept for member lists. Um, we have to change that because our, our ability to manage that is, is just too difficult. We get it in all kinds of formats now. So we're gonna be a little bit demanding on you this year um, and expect our, your member lists in this format. And we're hoping, hoping to make that really simple for you by providing you this list. And we're really looking for some really basic information here. So club name, the year we're curling in, pretty straightforward. And then we're really looking for your member information, just your first last name for your members. We're looking for a date of birth. If you remember in the past, we were looking for a date range or a year range, that's challenging for us to manage going forward. So the date of birth is important so that we can manage that member going forward as they get older. We can understand how our demographics of our, of our members are changing as well. Um, looking for gender, so male, female, other, um, email address and postal code. So pretty straightforward, um, really asking for your cooperation to collect this information from your members this year. And then the third piece is your member fees. So we have not changed our membership fees for this year. It's gonna, we've held it at $15. Um, so that includes $13 of Curl Sask member fee and the $2 Curl in Canada member fee. The $13 we get go back to programs and services that we provide to you. Um, and you know, we're, we're really working hard to hold that down. Um, you know, there are certainly costs, as you know, going up in the world, but we've decided due to um, challenges with COVID, and we know you're all under challenges where that to hold it for $15 for this year, for sure. And then um, we've also got it added an advanced membership benefits area on the website as well. So if you click on this membership benefits tab here, it really goes um, to our new membership benefits page which um, really shows you all the programs we provide and services we um, work on and resources we give you at the club level. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go on, a lot of things we do. I won't go through them all tonight. I really uh, encourage you to go to the web, this page and, and read through all those things. Um, and certainly if you're having questions from your members on what those fees go to, I would direct them here as well. So. You know, we offer a lot of financial assistance to clubs through the MAP pro pro grant, um, through clinic grant programs, through youth spiel grants. Um, we do, you know, offer the ability to host events, um, all the Curl Sask events, plus Canadian and Association event, Curl Canada events as well. We do a lot of communication um, through the website, through our social media platforms, through these town halls, um, also player and coach town halls through our newsletters and yearbooks. Um, a lot of work goes into our training and certification opportunities as well, whether that's for youth curling development, for coaching, ice techs, 
and umpires, and a lot goes into our high performance programs and consulting as well. And then a big piece of what we do as well is event management. So we purchased some new equipment this year to really make some of those events in our curling clubs look almost like an arena setting. So you'll see some of that this year. Um, our live scoring of events will continue, which I know a lot of people rely on across the province. And then we will be continuing to webcast and broadcast um, some of our major events as well. So that's just some of the things we do. Um, but that's where your fees are going to. So jumping into the membership assistance program, um, again, which is better known as MAP. So what is the membership assistance program? I know some of you have been around for a number of years and, and know what this is inside and out, but for those new members, this is really our Curl SAS program um, that was established to allocate funding that we received from SAS Sport through the proceeds from lottery ticket sales in Saskatchewan. So we had some funding from um, through SAS Sport from lotteries, Saskatchewan lotteries. And this is how we distribute that funding. So there's really four components to that. Um, there's base map funding, there's event, event hosting grants, there's membership allocation, which is for those of you who have been around a bit is our old map bonus um, program, and then youth programming support as well, which is, is we're putting in place. So walking through each of those, this is our base map funding um, grid for this year. So it's really that base map funding for clubs. Um, it's based on two components that have not changed for some time. One is population of your community and, and the other is the number of sheets you have. So you can find yourself on this grid and you can see what funding um, is available to you from map should you apply and, 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 spend the, and spend some expenses to drive curling in the province. So that's really the base funding piece. And this, has, this did not change. There was a couple tweaks to a couple of the spots in this this year, but the overall formula did not change. And then the, there's some event hosting grants that comes out of this fund as well. So if you're hosting any of our um, championships or qualifiers, um, you will um, have access to event hosting grants as well, well. And that's allocated by the number of teams in the event. So that's the amount you see here, amount per team, and then the max dollars would be um, based on how many teams are in that event. So those are available as well. If you haven't hosted events in the past, I encourage you to, to reach out to our events um, manager, Bruce Cordy, and, and, and do some of that hosting. And then number three is our membership allocation bonus, which is really the map, the old map bonus. So we've done some tweaks to this a little bit this year, tried to make it simpler. We used to have a very convoluted formula um, and it's really to allocate map funding um, that's over and above what we've allocated in our base funding. And how we're gonna allocate it this year is, it's going to be $8 per member per sheet. Um, and it, it'll be based on your 2019, 2020 membership numbers. So it'll be based on your pre COVID um, membership numbers, since there was a lot of hiccups and a lot of clubs this last year due to COVID. And then the youth programming support program we've added this year as well. So this is really a program to recognize the importance of youth programming in the province. So clubs can apply for a $200 a grant for running Curl Sask approved youth programs. And there's gonna be a lot available this year um, that you can access. Um, so jump on this because we only have funding in this program for the first 75 clubs who apply. So um, if, you're, if you're planning to run some youth programs, jump on this and apply for this piece of it um, early on as well. So how to apply for MAP? Um, it's really, first step is to complete your online MAP application form. And again, that's combined now with your membership form. So if you're filling out your membership form, which all of you will have to do to affiliate, you might as well go in and start working on your MAP application at the same time. Those dates align. We're looking for those by October 31st. So fill in that form. And then we're really, then you'll, you'll have to wait for about 30 days 
for approvals from us. So we'll go through all those applications, make sure you're what you're applying for for um, funding um, fits in with the with the criteria that we have in place for that funding, and that's really driven by Sasport. Um, and then we'll let you know to go ahead. And then you really your next step is to is to submit your map follow up form with receipts by February 1st, 2022. Um, and then as fast as we can turn those back to you, um, we're trying to get those back to you um, two weeks following receipt of all those necessary components. And then really your last step is to recognize SAS lotteries for their financial contributions. So again, this can all be found in the map and in the mem under member clubs under map app, map program. And this is what it'll look like when you go to the website and it'll walk you through this fairly, fairly simply on the website. So again, step one, click on this, fill out your membership form and your map application, wait for your, wait for your approvals. And then your follow up, then you'll go here, click on this map follow up form, fill it out online, um, send us your receipts. Um, and then basically wait for your payment and then recognize SAS lotteries for their financial contributions. And we've actually put in, if you click on this, how to recognize um, SAS lottery, we give you some suggestions on what to do um, to, to fulfill that commitment as well. And then you can see at the bottom here, can't see this whole screen, but you can see all the map eligible expenses are listed there and all the ineligible expenses as well. So that's map. Ashley, has anything come in on the chat for questions or on that? I don't see anything in the chat, Daryl. Okay. So we'll keep moving. Um, so the next piece I wanted to cover this evening was around a Curl SAS Club survey that we're going to send out to you um, either tomorrow or the next day, certainly this week. So this is going to be a short survey monkey questionnaire, similar to what we've sent you in the past. Um, and the purpose really is to assess the financial strengths of our clubs coming out of COVID or coming out of our first year of COVID anyway. Um, so it's really going to um, ask you some questions around what your club membership expectations are for this season. Certainly we know that's you're not going to know all those answers. We're looking for your best guess on a lot of these things, just so we can kind of understand what you think, where you think you're heading. Um, we'll ask you some questions around your biggest challenges for the upcoming season, season, and really a few questions on trying to gauge how strong our clubs are financially, um, and then ask you some questions around what you think your capital expenditure our needs are for the next five years. And again, this is really for us to try and assess what we think our risks are um, in, in our club settings in the province. So that's really all we're trying to do here um, so that we can allocate resources um, if needed into those areas. So again, we'll send this out this week. I'm really looking for um, your responses by September 24th. So as soon as you get it, again, it's gonna take you probably three minutes to do. If you could fill it out, that would really be appreciated. Um, and then we'll share those results at our second town hall, which again is on, that we're gonna conduct on September 28th at 7 p.m. Okay. I just have some questions that came into the chat, Daryl, if you wanna pause for a second. Uh, just relating back to the membership data. So the first question is around date of birth. Uh, and should it be provided as listed in the example? So year, day, or sorry, year, month, day, as it was in the spreadsheet. Yeah, good question. Yes, so there'll be formatting in that spreadsheet that kind of leads you that way. But yeah, we'd really like it in that format if possible. Okay. Just so as, as more standard, we can keep it as we, so as we, what we'll do is we'll pull that information out of those spreadsheets um, into another database. Um, and that gets, the cleaner it is, the, the less work it is to make that transition. Yep, 
Absolutely. Uh, the next question from the Martinsville Club. Um, they've already done the registration, but did not ask their members for date of birth information. Uh, should they go back at this point and, and obtain that information um, from their members? We'd really, I know it's a bit of a pain, but we'd really appreciate it if you did. Um, again, as we build out this database, I mean, it's, it's going to be important to have that. Uh, I guess just leading from that, you know, one thing we've really seen in our sport is we've really got poor information on our membership. And what we're trying to do is build that membership, build that out um, so that we can get some, you know, understanding of, of where we're heading, what things we can put in place, you know, we see we've got, you know, very few junior members, obviously, we need to push junior programs. Um, if we see, you know, other things in our data that lead us in different directions, it's really going to guide us in, in kind of the programs and, and things we put in place going forward. So really important for us going forward. Okay, excellent. That's all I see in the chat for now, Daryl. Okay, awesome. So let's jump into return to play guidelines. So um, if you guys remember last year, we had pretty, pretty big return to play guidelines um, and certainly dynamic and changed um, a number of times as we went. And we're hoping that's not going to happen this year, but certainly keep in mind that, you know, as we know, it's very dynamic, the situation we're in on the COVID front. So so these may evolve over time, but this is what we, where we're at right now um, um, as we speak um, right now. So um, some of the things, you know, a lot of this stuff was pulled out of last year's um, return to play guidelines. Um, we tried to keep it as minimal as possible, um, but we think these pieces are still the important components to keep in play as we move into the, this year's season. So, um, as we prepare for opening, here's some of the key components we think we need to address. So one is establishing a return to play committee. Um, if you had one last year, that's great, re-engage it. If you didn't, um, we're suggesting you put one in place. It's important to have a, a small committee. I mean, it, that might be your entire board, depending on the size of your club, but um, that can make decisions fairly quickly because we know we're in a very dynamic, place, things happen rapidly. So to be able to pull together some decision makers in a, in a fast way, and a, certainly if you can get some people with some, you know, some healthcare or uh, backgrounds like that, it helps um, make those decisions as well and have those on your return to play committee. So we're rec recommending that again this year. Um, really want you to create a communication plan and communicate regularly with your members. This is really important as well, so they understand where you're at um, as, you, as you move to reopening. Um, ensure contactless payment available and use wherever possible. Hopefully, hopefully you've already got that in place. Um, develop guidelines for members, staff, and volunteers to maintain physical distancing wherever possible. We know this is not um, you know, a, a health um, mandate right now, but we, it's still important to try and limit the spread. So we're recommending that as well. And then restrict or consider limiting non-essential visitors. And again, all these things depend very much on your facility, your own situation, and what you think you can put in place and what makes sense for your building. Um, the next piece we really think is important as well going in that we all did very diligently last year and think it's still important going into this year is developing a thorough cleaning and disinfection plan for common areas like washrooms, locker rooms, et cetera, and keep that in place um, throughout the year. Establish community safety measures such as sanitization stations, on ice hand sanitizer, et cetera. Ensure frequent and regular cleaning of high touch surfaces like doorknobs and rocks. Uh, remove unnecessary common items like magazines, salt and pepper sh shakers. I mean, you can assess that your club um, based on what those items are. Um, maintain occupancy levels that allow staff and members to maintain social distancing, except for brief exchanges where possible. So that's kind of the key pieces we think on the cleaning the rink side. And then certainly the marketing piece this year is gonna be a priority. Um, 
and think we need to spend, all of us need to spend a lot of time on this piece. And a lot of it's around communication. So clearly and, you know, communicate clearly and often with your members on what your plans are for, for reopening. The more we communicate, you know, the more comfortable they feel coming back to the rink. So if they think you've got a great plan in place, they're gonna come back. Um, and some of the ways you can do that, again, depending on your situation, certainly social media. I know a lot of our clubs have Facebook pages, some Twitter, you know, announce those plans on those social media plans, on your reopening plans, you know, use email where possible if you've got that, uh, emails for your club members. And then if you have a website, um, certainly ensure that all that information is up to date and accurate on the website as well. And then another piece that really uh, came to light last year um, was waivers. And we strongly recommend curling clubs update and use their waiver, waiver forms um, before permitting anyone to curl in their facilities this year again. So really a waiver is a legal contract um, signed by a participant um, in exchange um, for the opportunity to participate, um, giving up their rights to legal recourse. So around injury and illness, um, we've got some updated waiver forms that you'll find in our return to play documentation that we'll be posting um, later this week, hopefully tomorrow, um, on the website. Um, and there's in the appendix of that, there's some waiver forms you can use and update based on the, from that. And there's also waiver forms for those of you using curling IO that you can use in there as well. And then for minors, um, a parent or guardian of a minor should sign an assumption of risk form. And that's really describing the physical risk related to participating in curling. Um, and also it, it, it gives, serves as informed consent that the parent is aware of the, of the risks of participation as well. So we'll, we've got an example in our appendix in that, for that as well. And you should really, and you really need to put these in place for your club. So now jumping into the hot topic um, of the day, which we've been spending a lot of time on um, over the last few days is, is vaccine mandates. So there's been lots of things happening on the vaccine mandate front, both in the curling world and um, in the rest of the world as well. Um, so before we jump into that, I just kind of wanted to read some of our statements from our board that we really think are important um, around this. Uh, around vaccine mandates and around our position on it. So um, our priority is the health and safety and well-being of all participants of curling in Saskatchewan. Uh, we certainly support our member clubs and respect your autonomy to operate successful curling facilities. And we support and respect um, our members' privacy as well. So these are all important aspects. Um, we are proud members of Curling Canada and we support their efforts to protect all participants by implementing mandatory vaccinations at their championships. And our board is united in, in their stance to protect the health and well being of athletes, staff, contractors, volunteers, and the general public. So, having said that, um, we are, um, it is mandatory and we have put in, play, in policy for Curl Sask events. That'll be mandatory for all participants in a curl SASC sanctioned activity to be fully vaccinated and provide proof of this vaccination prior to the activity. So just to clarify, when we say vaccination, that's defined as a period of 14 days since the second dose of a two dose COVID-19 vaccination series, what most people would say is considered fully vaccinated. And then sanctioned activities or curl SAS sanctioned activities include competitive games and events, practice at those events, um, camps or clinics that we run, um, off ice training that we would run and event meetings as well. So that's really what we're covering with this. And then on the youth programming side, we've, we've also put in place that all curl SAS coaches, instructors and consultants are required to be fully vaccinated and wear masks when working with youth of all ages. Um, so that's kind of the curl sask piece of it. Um, one thing there are some, you know, we certainly know there's going to be some people that request some um, may request exemptions from this. 
So we're really looking at this um, from, they're gonna have to submit those exemption applications to Curl Sask um, as soon as possible, preferably six weeks prior to attending or participating in a Curl Sask activity. And then our board and group will assess those um, exemptions and either grant them or not grant them as we move forward. So that's kind of the where we're at right now from a curl SAS standpoint. As far as member clubs go, um, again, I want to reiterate that, that we really respect the autonomy of each club to operate its own business, um, given your local environment and membership needs. We know what's right in a club in Saskatoon or Regina or Moose Jaw may not be right in, you know, um, Tagaski or wherever you are. Um, so we certainly respect that and, you know, respect your autonomy to make those decisions. Um, we do recommend, however, that each club meet with their board of directors and determine their own position on enhanced health protocols. So you really need to have a serious conversation about this on what you think is right for your club and your membership. Um, and then it's really a responsibility of each club to stay up to date and to follow the current health guidelines as well, which we know right now is, is, is minimal, but again, that's dynamic and could change as we move forward. So. And just in closing on that side, we are at CurlSask is recommending that all clubs adopt the mandatory vaccination policy to protect the health and safety of their members and community at large. So that is our recommendation. But again, as I said earlier, you have to assess your own um, clubs and, and needs. So that's really my presentation for this evening. Um, now we'd certainly like love to open it up for questions and comments from, from you guys, either in the chat or if you want to. Uh, unmute your phone and ask a question verbally. That's great too. I yeah, will give everybody a chance to think about their question. We did have one um, question come in while you were speaking. Paul from the Shellbrook Club um, is asking the million dollar question. So can we, can we require proof of vaccination? Yes, from all our uh, advice we've been given, we can require proof of vaccination. Certainly if you take that proof of vaccination and you're storing it, you need to, you know, keep it. It needs to be kept in a secure place. If you're just taking it as a one-time look and, and some of this is going to evolve over time. Um, the administration of it is going to be probably the bigger, biggest challenge if you do put it in place. We don't have, I, I would say we don't have all the answers on that as it's evolving. Um, the government's discussed having QR codes, certainly will help um, with that if they put that in place. Um, but again, this is, it's a bit of an evolving question as we speak on the administration of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I would just add to it's, it's really easy to get caught up in the logistics of how to do it. Uh, and it's it's almost two separate conversations. Is, is this the right thing to do? Is this going to protect my business and my members? Uh, make that decision first and then work through any logistics um, after. I mean, equally as important, but um, almost two separate issues. So um, onward now to Tim, I see, has his hand raised. Thanks, okay. Ashley. Uh, the question is, um, have you considered uh, what type of criteria you may use if people do apply for an exemption? So our consultations with our legal team at this point um, suggest that there are very limited grounds for an actual exemption. So if you were coming to us as a member saying, I'm not vaccinated, I just don't feel like getting vaccinated, that wouldn't be grounds for an exemption. Uh, so we'd be looking more so at um, medical reasons supported by documentation uh, from a doctor, um, potential legal grounds, again, have to be supported um, from a doctor, uh, and there are very few religious exemptions uh, that appear uh, to my understanding at this point. So um, our approach is working through them on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Um, there really isn't a one size fits all for these exemptions at this point, but uh, those would probably be the three broad categories that um, would be considered at this point. Um, as a follow up question, if, um, if you were indeed to then uh, agree that yes, this is worthy of an exemption. Um, have you got any any um, directions or, or criteria as to um, or accommodations what you would do with that person? So, for example, someone comes along and says, yeah, here's my doctor's note. I've, I've got allergies to a particular vaccine. I want to apply for an exemption and it's a strong case. Mm -hmm. um, is it just like, well, okay, you don't have to vaccinate or, or do you put an extra um, conditions on, on that person to say, or maybe you need to mask all the time while you're in the building. If we if we grant you the exemption, these are other things you would have to do. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a consideration as well. I think our approach to any exemption we receive is getting the right advice. Um, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer, so I'm consulting with the appropriate personnel to. Um, to let us know if the ground, if it should be exempt or not. From there, there are a number of accommodations. And um, I do want to point out the difference between someone competing in a curl SAS championship uh, and anyone that you're in an employment relationship with. There are very distinct differences between how far you have to go with your accommodations. Um, so to sum that up, if you're curling in a, a curl sask event, it's a non-essential activity, so to speak. Um, it's a sport uh, versus an employment relationship where a paycheck is awfully important and, and considered more essential. You would have to go further with accommodations in those types of cases from, from my understanding. So hopefully that helps answer your questions, Tim. Uh, yes, so, and my hand's still up because I haven't worked out how to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if you think if you think of any other questions, you are at the top of the line. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Daryl. Anything to add there? Anything I missed? No, I think you covered it very well, Ashley. Okay. Perfect. Um, we do have another question in the chat from Diane. So, for youth programming support, where can we find the approved programs? And assuming it's on the website. Yeah, you can find it. Um, you can find it on the website, and also you can talk to Dustin McCush because Dustin's are doing in charge of our youth programming now. So you can find his contact information on the website as well. And he's got lots of great things planned this year. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. I'll just make another call for uh, questions from those on the line. Actually, it's uh, Doug from Twin Rivers. Go ahead, Doug. Question. So from what I'm hearing, we, we don't really have a, a procedure in place to uh, vet a uh, vaccination. I, I, I guess I guess what I'm what I'm saying is right now, if our club was to implement that, the only ways that we could do that would see a proof of vaccination from the eHealth, mm -hmm. or perhaps accept a photocopy of their vaccine cards that they received when they got the shot. Th those are the two methods that that I would be aware of that we could use to, to prove vaccination status. Yeah, I think Doug, the other way is, and clubs are talking about this now, because um, I've been in some of the con conversations with the Saskatoon clubs is, is putting it right in their waiver forms that they declare they're, they're fully vaccinated and really putting it on the onus on them. Um, and then keeping that obviously in a safe place. Um, and, you know, then you don't necessarily have to go look at their card, look at whatever there is right now. Um, again, that's when I said there, I think there's going to be some things cleared up as we go forward as QR codes 
come to be that the government's promised. And I'm sure there's going to be some evolution on this right now, but I would say right now it would be put it on your declaration forms or some form that you're giving your members to, to sign and declare. Yeah, look at your, have them show you their card that they got when they got vaccinated or, or the one that you can print off the SaskHealth right now. To me, I, I think we need to still put, keep the onus on the member to be honest and, and you know, going forward. I mean, it's, we're not, we don't want to be policemen here. Right. Um, but we just want to do, you know, our due diligence as best we can. What do you anticipate for uh, Curl Sask events? Because I, I believe it will be one of the first ones coming up in end of October. Yeah, so the, the current plan is to use the QR codes as best possible. Um, we're told that they should be released next week, right. um, but we're expecting more so start of October, I think, to be realistic. Um, we know that you know some or hopefully most will be able to use the QR code. The reason we want to encourage that as much as possible, it avoids storing any personal health data and when the code is scanned, it's a pass or fail. It's not necessarily anybody's health record or health information. So that helps to protect the organizations as well as the person's privacy. So that's kind of our gold standard. From there, it would be a printout or screenshot of your COVID vaccination from SASC Health. Uh, and then the next option from there is the card that you received um, and proof of your identity alongside with that as kind of our third level. Um, and we will work to make it as pain-free as possible. We don't, we don't intend this to be a make work project, um, but it has to be manageable. And obviously we have to do our due diligence to make sure that our events are as safe as possible. Right. Yeah, and, I, and to add on to that, you know, I think it's a different conversation a little bit from an event or you're checking people at the door, you may you have somebody at the door to your regular club operations that you don't necessarily have somebody at the door. So you don't want to check it every time they come in the door, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. You bet, Doug. Thanks for the questions. Um, Dave. Uh, mine is in the same vein, and it's with the exemptions. Uh, for me to go to a rider game, uh, my only exemption is to have a negative COVID test 72 hours prior to going to the game. Is Curl SAS looking at this kind of requirement as well uh, if they're going to uh, give out exemptions? Short answer is no, it wouldn't be accepted. The way the policy is worded right now, a negative test would not be accepted in place of the double vaccination which falls a little bit more in line with Curling Canada's policy, um, which is the same. So just negative test or, um, or not attend basically um, from a fan perspective. So if there is an exemption or, or medical reason, health reason behind um, not being vaccinated, we'll give it um, full consideration and review to see if there is an exemption and then an accommodation after that being a negative test or masking, distancing, whatever we can work with from there. But um, to get to that, we would have to go through the exemption process. Okay, I understand that part, that the exemption is not a given. But assuming that a person has got an exemption from you and wants to curl in a curl SASC event or attend a curl SASC event, uh, are they, they're going to have to then have a, a negative test. Is that my understanding? It is one opportunity. There may be masking alongside that. Um, probably depends on the specifics of their role in the actual event. But um, yes, it, a negative test or masking could be one of those accommodations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Good question. Okay, just jumping back, um, Bill Wepler. Um, he agrees that the onus should be on the member, but disagree that merely signing a form and saying that they have been fully vaccinated would be sufficient. Um, in Bill's opinion, the member curling club should have to show proof of vaccination, whatever method that is currently um, 
available and into the future as well. So kind of comment to, uh, to Daryl's earlier point. So yeah, definitely a difficult balance between you know, putting a policy in and then having the resources to operationalize it. So that is the gray area that we are, are living in. And I think this entire conversation has to be prefaced by make sure as a board of directors, you're getting appropriate advice for your situation. Um, we are doing our best to pass on our advice or our learnings, what we have learned along the way, but that might not be appropriate advice for your club. So uh, this is a good opportunity to engage with a legal team, engage with doctors local in your area and familiar with the guidelines. Um, so I would, would take uh, Bill's comment as an opportunity to just remind people um, to um, make sure you get that legal advice at this point as well. So and David, Dave's got a sound. Yeah. Uh, a question around the QR code um, cards that are in the, in the works and uh, we'll assume October that they're available. Um, what about the readers? My understanding is it's going to be an app of some sort. Do you have any information as, uh, is this app something that we run on a phone or a laptop or, uh, is it a, a special device or what's it going to entail? So my understanding at this point, um, just from meetings that I've been on and conversations with government representatives is that it would be an app that is downloaded, um, on a phone, on an iPad, or some device like that. The intention is to make it as accessible to as many businesses as possible very quickly. Um, there are QR code scanners available. You can grab them on Amazon. I just don't know if they're going to work yet. Um, so that is one of the issues we still have to work through. Um, but I would expect using your phone or an iPad um, would be suffice from the information I have right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I don't see anything else in the chat, Daryl. Don't have any. Good. Okay, we'll keep moving then. So really just to wrap up then, um, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we will follow up with an email um, as, um, with a copy of the presentation. We've also um, recorded the presentation and we'll, you'll get, we'll make that accessible um, as well to you. And then again, our next town hall where we're going to cover some other topics um, prior to most clubs opening um, is planned for September 28th at 7 p.m. So hopefully to see you all then. We'll be sending out invitations a um, few days before that hits. So probably end of the week before that. So thank you all again for attending and uh, have a good evening.